How does one follow with that? <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah. To be like a little child. I think they preach better sermons than most adults. <laughs> All adults, actually. <laughs> As you'll detect, I get sermons quite readily from my own children. I hope that you have your Bible with you today. If not, I'm sure that if you raise your hands, one of the deacons or deaconesses will gladly place one in your hands. So I hope you have them. Someone came up to me the other week, or a couple of months ago actually, and said, uh, you have pretty sermons, <laughs> because of all the pretty pictures on screen. I have no pretty pictures today. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. But in actual fact, if you think about it, for the Christian, what this table displays, there is no prettier picture of what that represents. So I hope you have a Bible. If you don't, please put up your hands and somebody will get a Bible into your hand. This morning I would like to look at four, four passages of Scripture. Most of these you've read before, you've learned them in Sabbath school class, Sunday school class, and if you're a new beginner, if you've started reading the Gospels, you would have come across these stories. I want you to follow, they're not going to be on the screen, and I want you to feel comfortable because I'm going to ask you some questions. The first is found in the book of Luke, so the third Gospel in the New Testament over near the back of the book. Of the, of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. This morning I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. We ready? Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, speaking of Jesus, when he was just 12 years of age, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. Verse 44, supposing, assuming him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, and then they began to search for him amongst their relatives and acquaintances and when they had, did find him uh, sorry and when they did not find him they returned to Jerusalem searching for him after 3 days they found him in the temple sitting amongst the teachers listening to them and asking them questions and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers and when his parents saw him they too were astonished and his mother said to him son why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why? Why? Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them back to Nazareth. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and man. What strikes you with this story? Just as I've read... What you've read in the past, what is most striking? What are some of the things that come into your head when you read this story? For me, for instance, he was away for three days. <laughs> Who sheltered him? Who took him in? Who fed this 12-year-old boy? What comes to your mind? Don't be shy, you can answer this. I wouldn't ask you the question, I wasn't going to really want your reply. You're not going to be wrong. I'm curious, when you read Scripture, what jumps out at you? What captures you? Nothing? 
Three days, perhaps without food. He's done it before. Why, he's going to do it again, I should say. I, I can't understand that they would take off. In fact, I've often wondered, uh, Donna, I've often wondered, what were the tabloids recording for this event? <laughs> what were they reporting? Parents? <laughs> Distracted parents? While down in Caesar's casino, left the kid on the back of the camel. <laughs> what were they reading? Was anybody saying anything that a child was left in the bustle of a major city? What was it that distracted these parents? The text actually alludes to it. Friends, relatives, acquaintance, they thought he was with them. They searched amongst their friends and their acquaintance. The thing that's striking for me is that they made an assumption. They assumed that he was with them. As parents, it's very easy to make those assumptions. That there's little feet following behind. Let's go to the next one. You're very quiet this morning. Let's go to the next one. Mark chapter... I think it's three, four. Mark chapter four. So just come over. Matthew, Mark chapter four, beginning at verse 35. Mark chapter four, beginning at verse 35. On that day... When evening had come, he said, this is Jesus, after a hard day's work of preaching and teaching up on a hillside, he said to them, to his disciples, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, he took with them, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What strikes you with this passage, this story? They're still asking him why? <laughs> and he's still asking why. You still have no faith. Right? The disciples really didn't understand. What Jesus was, what he was capable of, I like that. Anyone else? I see David fidgeting. We haven't. We're not supposed to be afraid. Well, actually, we're supposed to be come with fear and trembling to work out our salvation. I know what you're saying. But it should be a serious matter. Steve up the back. I still like that, what you're saying. Steve. That's interesting. At this stage, he's still the teacher. Isn't that fascinating? I like that. Did you hear that? They go from being fearful and scared of the storm to being fearful and scared of Jesus. Who is this? That the wind and the seas obey the voice of this man. Who is he? I love the phrase, and it comes back to what Ray has pointed out here, is that it says that they took, in verse uh, 36, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. That is fascinating. Why? Because sometimes we forget that Jesus is holy, human, 
Do you understand? He is fully human and fully divine. See this in this story. They are both coupled together. He was able to cease the wind and the calamity of the sea by the opening of his voice. As one of our illustrious presenters here a while back said, shut up to the wind and the waves. It wasn't a meek and mild, peace, be still. But here it says they took him just as he was. No packing a bag. He asks to be taken across to the other side for peace and tranquility. And we know what was about to happen because our three speakers in a row for Follow Him did it one after another and they had no idea that others had done it. They spoke off the shores of Genesaret with a man who, was, who had a legion of demons possessing him. They knew the devil knows what is about to happen. And that storm was a demon-inspired storm. It was a clarion call from the demons. They tried to sink the boat and the boats with him before it even got to the shore. They know what was coming. In fact, he makes an, an incredible statement. One, the, the man possessed by a demon. Have you come before our time to torture us? Another topic for another day. But we as Seventh-day Adventists have all right to see that there is judgment going to happen. The devils know that and they shriek. They know beforehand what is going to happen. But it says to me, where it says that they took him just as he was, he was frail in his human sense. He was what in the back of the boat, in the stern of the boat? He was asleep. Do you know what is really interesting? And we're going to get to it, Donna is that he had his head on something. What did it say? Why does it say this? Why does it have to mention this particular thing when they could have mentioned anything else? He had his head on a... And it actually says on the, a specific... Remember, the cat sat on the mat or a cat sat on a mat. It's a specific cat and a specific mat. The definite article. The history tells us that the boats actually had at least one, if not only one, cushion. And it was for the steersman who sat at the back of the boat. It's usually made out of leather. And they sat on it and steered the boat. The steersman, and, we, and the question we've got to ask is, who was steering the boat? Jesus was on the back. This is not one of these princess cruisers as multi-leveled, multi-decked cruisers. This is a single hull, flat boat with a set of seats at the back where the rudder was and they could steer it. Someone, one of those disciples, had given him that particular spot because he said he was in the back of the boat, in the stern of the boat. Other commentators will actually say that perhaps he was, he was given the nets, the fishing nets, to lay his head. Why? Because these boats were not dry. The planks of wood would have been soaking wet damp, smelling. I'm sure the fishing net smelt as well. Jesus, it shows that Jesus suffered in his humanity, but he accomplished so much in his divinity through that humanity. Don't get lost with what I'm saying. But it gives us a snippet to see what Jesus traversed for you and I. He asked to take time. He asked to go to the other side. And I believe he knew what confrontation was about to happen and he had a little nap. But they were so fearful. They became so scared of the waves, these illustrious fishermen, these skilled fishermen. And finally, they remembered that they gave him the front seat of the boat, meaning the back of the boat that steered the boat and they had forgotten. I love this passage. Let's go to the next one. Luke chapter 24. There is a purpose in looking at these, and we're going to get to it. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 onwards. Luke chapter 24 and verse 13, and this is one of my most favorite stories in the New Testament. Luke chapter 
24, beginning at verse 13. That very day, two of them, two of the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes, it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is the conversation? What is it that you are talking about? What are you talking about with each other as you walk? And they, this translation says, and they stood still. They stopped. They stood still looking sad, downcast, other translations will use. Then one of them named Cleopas, he answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem? In other words, what planet are you from, are from that you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed, and the word of God and all the people and how and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. And then if we skip down to verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ, that Christ, that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then in verse 28, so they drew near to the village of Emmaus to which they were going, and he acted, Jesus acted as if he were going to go further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures, and they arose that same hour and returned immediately to Jerusalem? What strikes you with this story? It's a pretty reoccurring theme, isn't it? Oh, foolish ones. <laughs> it's not the best response. <laughs> what does this passage, this story tell? What does it tell you? Sometimes the question that is asked, well, how dare God play a game of hide and seek? Now you see me, now you don't. Now you see me, now you don't. What's he playing at? And often when people say, well, their eyes were hidden. But if you look at the story and you read the story, their hope, they hoped that he was the Christ. Folks, they were returning. They were returning to Emmaus, their hometown. They were returning with the sun setting in their gaze, a seven-kilometer-odd journey, seven-mile journey. Quite literally, the sun was setting in their eyes, but figuratively, their whole dream, their dreams, their aspirations, their hope that Jesus was the one has come crumbling down. No doubt there are tears in his eyes, in their eyes. No doubt they were dragging their feet like children, kicking at the dust, kicking at the pebbles, some harder than others, because they're frustrated, they're angry, they're sad, they're bewildered. They could not see, they could not recognize Jesus because the sun was setting in their eyes. The dust and the tears were welling in their eyes and because of their circumstance, they could not see Jesus. John chapter 20. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John 20, beginning at verse 30. In fact, I've shared this briefly with you quite a few months ago. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 30, it simply says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but in verse 31 it says, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What's the connection with those three stories and these two verses? What's the connection? Natalie. Slow to learn. <laughs> Yeah. Love it. God is patient, Natalie has said, and he's slowly getting to us. We are slow learners or slow to learn, and it just keeps happening over and over and over again, but God is still there getting our attention. Um, Annie? They hope. Ah, blessed are those that have seen, but more blessed are those that have not seen yet believe. These things are written in this book, the book that you have in your hand, whether it's yours or borrowed, that you can be certain, and only you can make that decision in your search and your seeking, that he is the Christ, that you might have life through his name. The connection for me is simply this. Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. As a boy, Jesus' parents looked for him when they had lost sight of him. But he was in their midst. He was in their midst. Luke, Mark chapter 4 and verse 35 onwards, the boat on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples had lost sight of him, even though he was in their midst. Luke chapter 24 and verses 13 onwards, the road is the despondent disciples had lost sight of him. They didn't even recognize him, even though he was in their midst. Right beside him. A question that comes to mind in relation to these verses for me is this. Who is it that has their eyes wide shut? Who is it? Whom is not seeing who? About six months ago, I woke up just before my usual time, just before 3 a.m. It doesn't help when you finally drop off to sleep at about 1 a.m. <laughs> and before I get into my habit of reading, I have another habit that takes precedence. I sneak into my children's bedrooms just to see if they're okay. Caitlin was sprawled out. I had to smile because she takes after her mother. <laughs> but as I looked at my son's bed, my countenance suddenly changed. Parents, you know, something happens to your heart. I used to do skydiving, and Tina, you've done it too, and Brendan. You know that feeling, that sinking feeling? Your heart's way up here in your mouth. At two years of age, Ezekiel was nowhere to be seen. He was gone. Uh, I'm talking about you, son. Like a wave of electricity, a surge of fear swept through my body. I immediately turned the dim light to glaring. 
The bed was most certainly minus its cargo. I immediately dropped to the ground on all fours, even though that I knew that he couldn't fit between the bed and the floor. I still peered under the bed, thinking that maybe he somehow crawled under the bed, but he was nowhere. He was not there. Folks, my heart was instantly pounding. I could hear it. I could feel it in my chest. It was pounding. It was the most frightening, sinking, sickening feeling that I've ever had. And I can remember leaping from my all fours. I spotted my reflection. I spotted myself in the sliding mirrored door of the wardrobe and I bounded up thinking that he'd crawled in there and he has a habit of closing the door behind him and locking himself in there to jump in and say, boo! <laughs> Maybe he'd fallen asleep today. And I got up and I opened the door, nearly smashed the glass on it and he was not in the wardrobe. I was truly gripped by fear. You see, it was at that moment, in fact, what I did from that moment, I actually raced. I had a thought. Maybe he slipped into our bedroom during the night and he's lying in, on our floor or our bed and I didn't notice when I had got up. So I raced back in there and he was nowhere to be seen. There was still some snoring going on, so I tried to make sure that I was focused and not seen. Or that, that I could actually see if he was there. But folks, I was gripped with fear because it was right at that moment. It was right at that moment that I remembered something. You see, I heard a sound in the night which did wake me. But I paid little attention to it. You see, I dismissed it thinking that it was the sound coming from my neighbor's house. It was the sound of a garage door opening. And in an instant, I bolted, I ran downstairs, I hurtled down the stairs. You see, it was only a few days before I was watching Ezekiel. He didn't know I was watching him. I was watching and he did something. He was so proud of himself, and I was proud of him. You see, he had come to the, he had went to the dining room, and some of you have been to our place. He went to the dining room, he took one of the chairs, and he slid it across the wooden floor, pushed it up to the door that enters into the garage. He had climbed up onto that chair. He had reached up and turned the doorknob and pushed the door open. He climbed back down, pushed the chair out into the garage, climbed back up onto the chair, and with his little finger had reached up on tippy toes and pushed the button to the roller door. And in an instant, he fled down the driveway like a Jack Russell Terry on speed. <laughs> and it was here that I remembered what he had done. And folks, my heart was pounding. I bolted down to check the door. The door was closed. The roller door was closed. And all the chairs were exactly where they should have been. Folks, I turned the whole house upside down. Believe me, I was praying the whole time. I was praying the whole time. But then I suddenly stopped still. I stopped still. I had come to the end like those fishermen, hardened, seasoned fishermen, sailors of the sea, I had come to the end of my skill. I stopped still, and I heard this voice clearly say in my head, look in his room. Look in his room. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever lost something that's important to you? <laughs> Perhaps you're late for a meeting. Perhaps you're late for work or studies or whatever it might be. And you've lost your car keys. 
And then someone says, have you checked your pockets? <laughs> Where was the last place you looked? I don't know about you, but when I'm, I'm really frustrated, I want to yell back and say, what, you think I'm stupid? Of course that's the place I've looked. Do you think I'm blind? <laughs> I may have had my back this way, but Natalie, <laughs> it wasn't. Was that you? Forgive me. But you're tarred with the same brush. <laughs> I was at my wit's end. I didn't care about the voice in my head, calling into question my maleness. <laughs> that I'm on top of things. With the little energy that I had left, I raced, I skipped every second step up to his bedroom. I looked at his bed, but still no sun. It was empty. And once again, I stood frozen with fear. I stopped. I was still. But it was then that I decided. It was then that I studied his bed. A king-size bed, mind you. I studied his bed and I noticed something. I noticed the pillows all lined up neatly against the wooden bed head. And as I watched, these pillows were ever so slightly rhythmically heaving. <laughs> now, if you had witnessed what came next, you would have thought that I had just been hit from behind by a moving motor vehicle. Now, I have actually seen a cyclist being hit from behind. It was as if the character was like a limp doll being catapulted, shot from a cannon. What I did next, I flung myself, I catapulted myself onto the bed and pulled away the pillows, and there behind the pillows lay my little Houdini, <laughs> fast asleep. He had one of those little tiny smiles around the corners of his mouth, fast asleep, content, no doubt proud that he had hidden himself. <laughs> John chapter 20. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Now, a couple of months ago, I, I, I talked about this in passing and I said to you, have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what those other signs might be? And some of you, you said you were nodding away, and I said, well, stop it. Stop it. Because in verse 31, it says there is enough evidence, there is enough signs that are written, that are written in these verses to give you faith. But as you look at this text, you could also see it this way. That in a sense, it is when we stop and be still, those other signs could also be alluding to our experiences as disciples of Jesus that are not written in Scripture. They are yours to keep. For those of you and I who sometimes doubt how God has sorted us out, and has dealt with us, who has revealed himself to us, and continually, Diana, patiently saying, why don't you have faith? Verse 31 is for you and I, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. And so my question for us this morning is simply this. Have you found the Son of God? Have you found the Son of God? Have you found the salvation which he offers 
that he offers that is like no other, a salvation which quickens but also quietens the soul. If you haven't, if you haven't, then what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? If you are sick and tired of what life is continually throwing, dishing up to you, then do something about it. Do something about it. You, scripture tells us, you see, it tells us that salvation lies at your fingertips. Salvation lies at your fingertips. Therefore, search the scriptures and something amazing is going to happen, is going to transform in your life. Make this the driving force of your life. Quicken your steps to find he who is the saviour of your life. Don't allow anything else to take precedence over this. Open your eyes and you will see. Open the scriptures and you will see that Jesus is in our midst all of the time. All of the time. For our visitors this morning, there is a pretty picture standing over there. But before we partake of the communion, these emblems, these symbols of a greater reality in Jesus Christ, it is about Jesus being alive and in our midst. We follow any good, good parents' instructions to their grubby kids. Go and wash before you share this meal. Because our feet have strayed a little and perhaps too far. Jesus says before you partake of the communion emblems that represent me, that show that I am your sustainer, please go and wash your feet. You see, we are about to practice in something that is holy. This is holy ground. Why? Because it is an opportunity. It is an opportunity for each of us to stop and be still, allowing God's dear Son to reveal himself to you and I. Whatever your circumstances might be. But in another sense, it is also about us revealing ourselves to those that we have offended in this congregation. It is also about revealing ourselves to God and saying that He is all to us. That nothing else matters. That He is, as you partake of these emblems, the blood, the juice, the bread, the body of Jesus. We are declaring that he is worthy of our attention, that all that he has done and is doing has our full attention. That's what that is about. So folks, if you are one of these, and if you're really honest, we're all in the same sequence of spiritual life. If you think you have tried, and no doubt you have, if you think you have tried all this before and it hasn't really helped, and you're still seeking for something, if you still haven't found what you are looking for, I'm asking you this morning, as your pastor, to try it again. To try it again. Taste and see by stopping being still and knowing that God is is in our midst. He is with you today if you accept him afresh to sustain your life from this moment forward. He is waiting for each of us to be still and to seek him. It is then that he will speak to you and speak for you. May God bless you. May God keep you. But as we go through these doors, our ladies to the left, the larger room, the gentlemen to the room on the right, take a friend. If you've never done this, you are more than welcome. It's about being still, hearing God's voice. But it's also about God and he who tries to whip up a storm in your life to hear who you are are believing and following. You are taking sides this day. Visitors, you are more than welcome to go and see how this is done. You can participate. If not, you are welcome to sit here. 
I prefer you to be out there, but our lovely Lydia it will take a children's story for us today, for our children that stays behind. But please go out, come back, and then we'll partake of these wonderful emblems. That is a pretty picture. It is a picture of reality. May God bless you.